Coming up on today's show, we're going to dive into a new report that says Denver is still interested in pursuing Josh Jacobs. Plus, we have some training camp takeaways and highlights to get to. But before we get to all that, selfishly, I ask if you have not subscribed, consider going ahead and doing so. The more subscribers we get, the more studio space I get, which means the more videos I am able to publish. So if you're looking for Broncos YouTube videos on the reg, consider subscribing and let's get to 14,500 subscribers. Let's jump right into it and let's talk about Josh Jacobs potentially coming to the Broncos because way back when Sean Payton said that he would love to have a running back like Josh Jacobs and he'd hopeful that the Raiders would let him walk in free agency and while we know that's not the case, Mike Florio over at Pro Football Talk still says that Denver is interested in Josh Jacobs if he does become available. And that's a big if, because right now the Broncos can't go out and just sign Josh Jacobs or something like that. But there are some options out there that could result in Jacobs hitting the open market. Let's run through the five options for Jacobs and the Raiders. Option number one, Josh Jacobs accepts his franchise tag and plays on it for $10.1 million. And that would run through 2023. Option number two, like the Giants, Jacobs and the Raiders agree to a new one-year contract. They cannot agree to anything past a one-year deal, but they could give him more money or more incentives or something like that, what Saquon and the Giants did. Option number three, Jacobs holds out. He doesn't play in the regular season. He misses all of it or some of it, but Jacobs could hold out and he would get no money. Option number four, the Raiders trade Josh Jacobs. Now, if this option does happen, the Raiders can't trade him to a team, and then that team signs him to a multi-year deal. Jacobs can only play on a one-year contract if it's with the Raiders or if he is traded to another team. And option number five, the Raiders decide, we're ha we've had enough of this headache, we've tried negotiating, we're not getting anywhere, we don't want him on this team anymore, and they rescind the franchise tender, and then Josh Jacobs hits the open market and... Well, he's probably not going to find 10 plus million dollars in August. No team is going to give that out anymore. So this would not be a good option for Jacobs if he wants to get more than 10 million. But it could be a good option for Jacobs if he wants to get revenge on the Raiders because he does not like how they have negotiated with him so far. And now we go to what Mike Florio said. Per a source with knowledge of the situation, the Chiefs and Broncos are among the teams interested in Jacobs. And while the Broncos could be a considerable way from contender status, they'd be an option at the right price. I interpret that as Josh Jacobs told his agent to tell Mike Florio, tell them that if the Raiders let me go, I want to go to Kansas City or Denver, two teams that are more RB needy teams than, say, the Chargers. Because I want to play the Raiders twice. I want to get two revenge games against Mark Davis and the whole crew up in Las Vegas and show them what a huge mistake they made. I don't think this is much about the Broncos or the Chiefs just coincidentally also wanting Josh Jacobs. And it also benefits Jacobs because he wants to go on a revenge tour. I think Jacobs wants the Raiders to know, if you let me go... You're going to play me twice, and I am going to bring it those two weeks. And the fan base is going to let you hear it, and you could be out of a job, which might sound a bit dramatic, but go talk to the old Titans GM. He got fired three days, two days, after the Titans played A.J. Brown and the Eagles. And the Titans ownership decided, oh, wow, that really was an awful trade. We just saw it firsthand. Our fans just let us know about it. You're fired. My take is, I'm not interested in Josh Jacobs. We've talked about him before on the channel. I'm not interested in trading for Josh Jacobs specifically. I don't want to see Denver give up assets for a running back that would have one year in Denver. Right? They cannot sign him to a multi-year contract. So you're going to give up a third or a fourth round pick, somewhere in that range, at least, maybe more, if the Raiders really take Denver for a run. And for one season... When Denver is not like the Bills, the Bengals, or a team that feels like they're just one piece away from going over the hump and winning the Lombardi, they're not that case for, for the Broncos in terms of adding one more running back. So for that reason, 
I don't want to see them give up an asset for him. And I also just don't want to see them ink him down to a multi-year contract, whether that's, you know, down the line after one season or Denver or something to that tune. I just don't think it's a good idea for the Broncos. Not because I hate paying running backs. I think that's one of the biggest sports cliches. Uh, fun fact, you have to pay a running back if you don't have a superstar quarterback. I know that the Chiefs have gone on and had great success with Isaiah Pacheco, a seventh rounder. Yeah, it's not because of Pacheco. It's because of a guy named Patrick Mahomes. And if you don't have a Patrick Mahomes, you might need a good running back to push your offense. But that's not why I'm not interested in Josh Jacobs. For me, it's more about the history of the running back position, where there have been a lot of guys who had great seasons, and some of them have great seasons afterwards. But there is something to the history of, winning the rushing title, and it's not always going so well the next year. Like Derrick Henry, 2K Henry, the next year, after 378 carries, yeah, his body pushed back a little bit, and he missed half of the 2021 season. Christian McCaffrey, after getting 287 carries and 116 receptions, what does his body do? He only plays three games the next season. Now, sure, these could be just uh, anomalies. Maybe these are outliers, but... There is something to looking at previous running backs who had phenomenal seasons, whether they led the NFL in rushing or top three, and it not being the same the next year. And if you don't believe me, just think about your fantasy football drafts for a moment. How often do you take the guy, the top three running back, with one of the first three picks, and he ends in the top three, right? There's always change at the running back position. So no, I don't want to see Denver fall trap to 2022 Jacobs and believe they're getting that guy in 2023. I don't think that's going to be the case. But let me know, should the Broncos pursue Josh Jacobs if available? Whether that's via trade with the Raiders, whether that's his franchise tag is rescinded and they can sign him to something. Let me know at the end of the day, would you like to see Denver go after Josh Jacobs? For me, I'm not interested. And because it's, there's a reason why Jacobs did not have his fifth-year option picked up. Look at his first three years in the league. Good, very good rookie, rookie season. 4.8 yards a carry, seven touchdowns. The next year, he averaged under four yards a carry. He got over 1,000 yards, but they also gave him 273 carries. Like, compare the amount of carries he got in 2019 and 2020, and look at the difference in yardage. And then in 2021... His carries go down, the yards go down, the average stays about the same. And then a breakout season in 2022, but that was on the backs of 340 carries. That's why he won the rushing title. Not because he was the best running back in football last year. If you want your running back to win the rushing title, give him 340 plus carries and they're going to finish top three. That If you just give them that much of a volume and opportunity they will churn out eventually over 1,000 yards and be in the mix. I think Jacobs leading the NFL in rushing last season was more of a fluke than a pattern. I don't think we have four or five more seasons of Jacobs finishing top three, whether it's one, two, or three in rushing. I think it was a bit of a one-hit wonder, which we do see from time to time in the NFL. This is not the first instance of this, right? We just talked about David Johnson. Now he was a one-hit wonder, and well, Good for the Cardinals. They sold high. They got DeAndre Hopkins for him. And the Texans found out that was a one-hit wonder. I think that's the path that Jacobs is on. And also, um, what about the guy that you selected in day two of the 2021 NFL draft? Javante Williams, who has been pulling off nearly a medical miracle for him to come back from the multiple knee-torn ligaments he suffered in 2022 in October. Why don't you wait and see what you have in him? I know we don't have the greatest data point set on, J on Javante Williams. We don't have a ton of numbers to fall back on and a lot of games play to really deep dive into what kind of running back Javante Williams is. But to me, it's not about which running back has more yards or touchdowns. If you're comparing Javante Williams and Josh Jacobs, right? Jacobs could have 200 more yards than Javante Williams this year. Let's say Jacobs rushes for 1,200 yards and 10 touchdowns. And Javante Williams rushes for 1,000 yards and 8 touchdowns. Okay? But Jacobs is getting paid $10 million, right? Meanwhile, Javante Williams is getting paid 10 times less than that. So would you rather pay 10x for 200 yards and 2 touchdowns? Or put $10 million in the bank, roll it over for next year into free agency, and have, yes, 
200 less yards and two less touchdowns, but 10 extra million dollars in the bank. I would take the latter. So that's where I stand when it comes to all the J uh, Josh Jacobs uh, trade signing saga and whatnot. I don't want to see Denver go down that road. Sure, they could get Josh Jacobs for pennies on the dollar. Even I could agree at $3 million, it's worth it. But it's not going to cost you $3 million. Next up on the show, we've got some training camp highlights and takeaways to look at here as day, where are we at now? Day 11? It has flown by. It's somewhere in that neighborhood of Denver training camp going into the first week of preseason. But before we get to all of that, today's show was made possible by our sports book partner, BetUS. Go to chatsports.com slash bet. Promo code Broncos125. When you put that in, they give you a 125% deposit bonus. So what does that mean in English? Well, if you put 100 bones in, they're going to match that $100 and give you an additional 25 So $225 to play with. Now, it is preseason football, so I'm not going to advertise going out there and sinking all of your money on second and third stringers. But if you want to make preseason football a little bit more enjoyable, just toss a little bit of cheddar on the over. Root for points, right? Points are always fun in the preseason. Who really cares who wins? At the end of the day, I hope the Broncos do not go 3-0 in the preseason because, well, going undefeated in the preseason usually means your backups are super good, but the starters are not good, and you're going to find that out in the regular season. So for that reason, give me a nice 2-1 uh, nice preseason, but give me the over in the Broncos-Cardinals game this weekend. Now, some training camp news I want you all to see. Zach Stevens tweeted out, another good day for Russell Wilson. He's starting to stack days really encouraging. Russ got off to a bit of a slow start in training camp, but I've seen a lot of great highlights. He had a great touchdown throw to Jerry Judy, so that connection seems to be getting stronger, but it's good to see, and like uh, Zach said, very encouraging because anyone can go out and have one good practice. People go out and have bad practices, but we need to see consistency because last year, Russ quietly had some bad practices, but everyone swept that under the rug because we were all so blinded by the fact that Denver finally got a quarterback for the first time since Peyton Manning, and we just wanted to sink our teeth into this team living up to the expectations and you know, not disappointing all the talent on the rest of the roster. Now, Sean Payton spoke to the media today about what to expect from this team in their first preseason game against the Cardinals. He said the starters will play 15 to 18 snaps. Well... Probably like two, maybe three series max, right? Let's say you go three and out. That's only three plays right there. But if you pick up one set of first down, one set, of, you know, one set of uh, first down, second, second, first down, um, maybe you get ten snaps on the first series and five or six on the second. So you're not going to see the starters for all that long. But he also said the pads are going to stay on the entire game, and there are no in-game interviews. Does anyone else remember last year, Cortland Sutton and Jerry Judy taking their pads off and having an interview on the sideline talking about this upcoming season and what it's going to be like with Russell Wilson? Because I remember that interview, and we're not going to see that interview again this year. This is a complete 180 from a season ago. Sean Payton said, whatever they did last year, we're doing the opposite of. And clearly, Sean Payton is not letting this team put the cart in front of the horse and letting them think that they are big shit or something? No. He is humbling them down to a D3 level where everyone's going to play, no one's too good for the preseason, and no one's too good to take their pads off and act like it's a JV game, and then do some sideline interviews and check out, have some snacks, and check out who's in the third row of the crowd. No. They are going to be dialed in for the entire game. They are treating this kind of like a regular season game as far as you know, preseason football can really go. And kind of bravo to Sean Payton. He's not putting up with any of the circus that was last year in the preseason where none of the starters played and it was a JV game for them. That's not the case in 2023. But what, let me know what you think. Should the starters play in preseason football? Last year, I got behind Hackett where I thought, you know what? You don't want to see any injuries. You've seen a lot of teams rest all their starters in the preseason. The Rams and the Packers were infamous for this. Kind of fell under the McVay tree. And it's worked out pretty well for them. But maybe it should be something you do after having success. And maybe you shouldn't do it in your first season as a head coach. So I like to see Sean Payton 
getting these guys out there because, sure, injuries suck. You don't want to see them. But Tim Patrick got hurt in practice, right? Who's to say someone else won't get hurt in practice? And if that's the line of the sand, then I guess we're just not practicing. And at that point, this team's going to suck in the regular season. So, yes, you don't want to see injuries happen, but it's the nature of the beast. It's football. You got to see them play. You can't just completely shut down all these guys until week one. If they haven't proven in the last couple of years, they are deserving of that. There are plenty of guys in the league that are deserving of that. This team won five games last year. Let's not give them anything before the first week of the season. Some other news from training camp I want to share with all of you. Brandon Johnson, the UDFA out of Central Florida last year, who, remember, he was awesome in the preseason, got an ankle injury, and I think it was the Cowboys game. Well, anywho, he was out for the first half of the season, then he joined the team later on. He had a touchdown, 42 yards. He has emerged as the Tim Patrick replacement, meaning, hey, who's the guy that's getting more snaps and more looks in practice now that Patrick isn't out there with the first-team offense? It appears to be Brandon Johnson, and I'm not too surprised by that. Some other news, some injury news I want you all to see. Frank Clark was spotted back at practice today. Really good to see. I, I'm very nervous about the edge rusher spot. Just the uncertainty of Randy Gregory and Frank Clark and the inconsistency of those two guys playing early on in camp. It's early on. You don't want to push it if they're hurt, but it's good to see Frank Clark back on the field. Because you're not going to have Baron Browning to start the season. And I really hope you do have Frank Clark and Randy Gregory. But right now, let's not, you know, get ahead of ourselves. To wrap up the show, let's get into our summer hot take today. The heat wave is over in Denver. So it's a nice high of 84 degrees, which means we get a warm plate take. And our warm plate take today is Russell Wilson. He gets one vote, at least one vote. For NFL Comeback Player of the Year. There's no clear and obvious like Alex Smith story or anything like that. So if Russ puts together a season that's just better than last year, I think there's going to be one voter out there that says that's Comeback Player of the Year worthy in my eyes. Plus, he's a big name. He's got a big following. There's going to be some beat reporter that goes, hey, Russell Wilson threw for 25 touchdowns and 10 interceptions. Talk about a bounce back season. That's comeback player of the year worthy in my eyes. I just need one vote. And I'm wondering how Russell Wilson feels about getting a comeback player of the year vote before an MVP vote. I'm guessing he's probably not a big fan of that Smitty. No, Smitty also disagrees. All right, we're going to sign off. We'll see everyone later.